Hello, Glen Hope family. I am so excited to be back with you. I am uh, feeling really good. I'm feeling really strong. Recovery is going well. Thank you so much for your uh, prayers, your phone calls, text messages, cards that you've sent out as I've been recovering from surgery. And then also the same as, as you have reached out to me and my family with the passing of my grandmother um, in the past week. Thank you so much for, for, loving, for loving me and for loving our family during this time. I want to give a special thank you to Pastor Kevin for uh, filling in over the last three weeks preaching and uh, did a great job leading us through Easter. So thank you so much for that, Pastor Kevin. I uh, also want to say a special thank you uh, for uh, the work that's been done since the whole coronavirus thing has shut us down from our normal uh, worship activities, and we've had uh, a good crew of people that have helped us get set up to be able to record our worship experience and then get it out to you, um, and then have continued that along the way. Of course, Josh Roberts has been uh, leading us with some worship music. A uh, special thank you to Jimmy Lott, the son, and Nick Thompson and Ken Rivers, uh, who helped us get set up with all the technology we needed and um, doing the editing and producing the video that you see on Sunday mornings. Uh, Rachel Pennington has helped out with some of our graphics designs, uh, perhaps Hannah Lott as well with that. And so just a thank you to everyone who has played a part in, in making this work over the last few weeks and uh, for however long we need to continue uh, doing this. Uh, it's been a good team at work. So this morning, um, we have for you uh, several things planned. You're going to, uh, in a moment, you'll see a video or a couple of videos from, from church members uh, just with sharing greetings and telling you hello and they miss you and they love you. And over as, as long as this continues, uh, we, we hope to have videos each week so that you can see the people that you do life with, your, your, your church brothers and sisters and just get a glimpse of, of some people and hopefully it'll bring a smile to your face. So you'll see that. And then you'll see Pastor Kevin with a, a call to worship, so to speak, something to get our minds focused on, on what we're about to do, um, a challenge as well to uh, being a Christian in this time. And then you'll hear from, from Josh Roberts leading us in music. And then I will be preaching a sermon. It's good to see you. Hi, Glenn Hope. We just wanted to get together this morning to say that we have missed you over these several weeks. I hope that we can get together real soon to study God's Word. Hi, church family. We have missed you so much. Uh, today's a beautiful day here. It's raining, but every day in the Lord is beautiful. We love you all. Hey, Glenn Hope family. Hey, friends. We miss y'all. Like, we can't wait to see you. We can't wait to get out of this house. Yeah. We got to go. Ready? Everybody! <laughs> come back. Everybody. That's it. No, we ain't doing too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hello, hello again, Glen Hope family. We are um, still meeting on um, kind of this modified way of doing things. We're trying to figure out how to navigate church life. And so as we start out today, I want us to think through what does church life look like? What are key elements of church life and how are we missing out on them and how can we take part in them the best we can um, while we're not together? And so to do that, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where it tells us, talking about the early church, the early believers, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And so those are some key elements of what um, makes up the activity of a church. And so these give us some areas where we can think through how can we as a church family continue taking part in these key elements, taking part, um, even though we can't physically be together, how can we do these things at a distance? And so first we're going to think about fellowship. Now in terms of fellowship, there, don't forget about the opportunities you have where some of the Sunday school classes are meeting um, via Zoom, via Google Hangouts, the same thing with the Bible studies that happen for the adults and the students. Um, so those are opportunities for fellowship. But another thing I want to encourage you all to do is to think of at least one person you would normally talk to 
on a Sunday morning. Somebody who you'd shake hands with, you'd chit chat with them before the service gets started and make an effort to call that person today. Make an effort to reach out to that person, say hi to them, how are you doing? Um, let them know that you've missed seeing them if you haven't talked to them since the last time we were physically able to gather. Um, in terms of the breaking of bread, we, got, we still were able to do that um, via the drive through communion. And I'd imagine that that's something that we'd still be able to do even if this is still going on at the next time we're supposed to break bread together and have communion together. You have the opportunity to continue taking a part in the apostles' teaching as Pastor Lewis leads us through the book of 1 Peter and continues to teach us from there. And we always have the opportunity to pray together. Now, certainly I'm going to pray for our time today, um, for the worship that Josh is going to lead us in, for the preaching that Pastor Lewis is going to give us. But I'm also going to give us a sort of interactive um, opportunity to pray together, uh, at least as close as we can do in this format. So first I'm going to pray for our service today, and then we are going to have an opportunity to pray together. So Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the fact that you give us technology where we can still interact with each other, where we can still um, come around your word and see what it is you have to say to us as a particular people here at Glen Hope. And I ask that you allow your spirit to move throughout this time, be with Josh as he leads us in worship, to be with Pastor Lewis as he unfolds your words to us. Give us wisdom and clarity. Help us to understand how your spirit is seeking to apply it to our hearts. And in that, help us to be obedient to whatever it is you call us to um, through the preaching of your word, through the moving of your spirit um, in our hearts. So I ask you, ask you all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And so... Now comes to our interactive prayer part, the interactive prayer opportunity that we're going to have. There's one prayer that many Christians know, even folks who aren't followers of Jesus Christ know this prayer, and that's the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm going to begin saying that, and I'd encourage you in your homes to say that along with me so that we can take part in this key element of the faith together. And so, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Yes, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. Father, we thank you that your power alone we can stand in, and we thank you for this time that we can gather uh, virtually and worship you. I pray that uh, as we move into this time of um, the sermon, I pray that you would continue to speak to us. I pray that we would have open ears and open hearts to receive what you have to say. Um, I pray that uh, we enter this time expecting you to move, and we um, 
that we want to hear from you, God. I pray that um, we would uh, just listen attentively and that we would take it, take what we hear and that we would go forth uh, and apply it to our lives. God, we love you and we thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Josh, for leading us in worship this morning. Now, friends, as we continue to worship with the preaching of the word, I'm going to move us back to the sermon series that we were in the midst of before coronavirus hit. And uh, when, the, when the whole pandemic started, we, we took some time away from the series that we were in to, to preach a sermon that was appropriate for what we were going through. And then we uh, had the Lord's Supper, and then we had Easter. And so it's been uh, several weeks now since we've been in the book of First Peter. But I thought it appropriate today to, to, to get back to some sense of, of normalcy, if you will. And uh, normalcy for, for hopefully for you, and I know it is for me, as it's uh, uh, kind of my pattern in, in preparing to preach each week. It, it's it's just uh, easier to, to be working through a, a book of the Bible. And so uh, that's what we're committed to, and that's what we're going to get back to here today. And so you may recall, as we've been working through the first chapter of First Peter for, for several weeks, that uh, one of the things, or some of the, some of the big ideas that we see that Peter is, is honing in on is uh, salvation and the... Uh, the cause of salvation, God causing us to be saved, Jesus Christ being the agent of salvation, Jesus being our living hope. And then uh, he talks some about our inheritance that is unblemished and undefiled. He talks then about what all this means for us, the impact of, of salvation on our lives and the call to holy living. And that's kind of where we, we worked our way through the first 16 verses and so today we're going to pick up in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, work our way through verse 21, which will be uh, part one of a two-part series. Um, when you look at verses 17 through 25, uh, I think the big idea is redemption in all of those verses. And so I've split that into two weeks, uh, truth about redemption part one, the truth about redemption part two, and that's going to be our focus. Today, we'll focus on verses 17 through 21. The scripture says this, If you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray. God, our Father, we are so thankful for your word. Thankful, God, for for the truth that it is, for the clarity that we can have of it when we study it, when we put the time in, God, to, to understand it, to, to hear how it is you're speaking to us through your word. We pray that today, God, that as we uh, study your word together, uh, that we will indeed understand with clarity, that we'll be able to make a strong application in our lives, uh, that we will walk away transformed. I pray, God, that there's someone, multiple someones, who hear this message about redemption today, God, and that their hearts are, are moved, their minds are, 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 are challenged to, to consider their own redemption and where they stand in relation to you as Father and as Judge and Jesus as Redeemer. And I pray, God, that they will think long and hard about the the offer of grace and mercy that you put before them and that they will indeed then surrender to that and know the truth of redemption in their own lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my friends, uh, 
couple things that we want to see about redemption today as we work through verses 17 through 21. And the first thing is this, redemption is granted by the one true judge. We see in verse 17 that the scripture says, if you address his father, the one who impartially judges, according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. The one true judge is indeed God the Father. God the Father and the judge are one and the same. And that is made clear here as we, as we trust this. So what are the, the ramifications of this? One of the things we understand is that uh, God the Father can be judged and is really the only right judge that there is. Uh, first of all, because he's, he's pure and holy and perfect. And so we can trust his judgment to be right, to be sure, to be sound. We, 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 we just can't have that level of trust with any other judge in the world. No matter how good an earthly judge may be, we cannot trust them as judge like we can God the Father. It is important that we don't miss this aspect of, of God the Father as judge because God the Father has, has one, created all of humanity. He has created the earth. He has created the universe. He has created all that we see and that we can't see. And so because he has created this, it's his. And that puts him in the position to judge what what is his. I I think we can all on some level kind of understand this idea of, well, if, if I made it or if I bought it, then I can determine what happens to it. That, you know, we, we, we understand that on a human level that, that falls so far short of what we're talking about. But, it, but it's about the, uh, one, of the, one of the best illustrations that, that we can come up with in, in, in terms of trying to understand how God is Father, God is Creator, sets Him up to be the one true judge. You know, uh, as I mentioned, and as many of you know, just in the past week, my grandmother died. And... One of, the, one of the things I loved about my grandmama, I loved a lot of things about my grandmama, uh, but one of the things I loved was she was a wonderful baker, and she passed that love along to me. And so when I found out that she had passed, uh, one of the things that I did for my family over the weekend was I said, you know what, I'm going to make a red velvet cake. That was, that was my favorite thing that she made. And so I made a red velvet cake following her recipe from scratch uh, for my family to enjoy. But because I made it, I was the judge over how much I got to eat of it. That's a good position to be in. I enjoyed that cake, and I enjoyed being the judge of how much I got to eat of it because I made it. And so because God has made us, it puts him in the the, uh, position then to, to be our judge, and it's a right position to be in. But then we also see that not just as creator is he in that position, but as father, he is in that position. Because then, and in particular, we're talking about redeemed people now, because it is only when we're redeemed that he moves from uh, the position of creator to the position of father. Because we become, when we're redeemed, we become as adopted children. We are adopted as sons and daughters of God. We are adopted as heirs uh, to the father. And so uh, when, 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 he, when we become adopted, he gives us his name. We take on his name. And when you carry someone's name, they, they, get in, they get to be in a position of judge. They get to tell you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, and, and move you to correction because of that position. And this is the position that we find ourselves in with God as Father. And so God... Uh, when we think about God as judge, we want to think about it on two levels. Uh, one is, is that level that we're going to focus mainly on in, to the, in today's uh, passage, and that is uh, God as judge of the redeemed. We'll, so we'll talk more about that. But then we, we cannot leave out the fact that God also judges those who are not redeemed. God is the judge of all because he has created all. And so then uh, the, the group of people, and, and in fact the majority of people on this earth, have rejected God as Father. They have rejected Jesus as Savior. They have rejected Jesus as Redeemer. So ultimately, if they go to their death, having rejected Jesus, 
then there's this, this judgment that comes on them from God. And that is the judgment to, 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 to hell. That is the judgment to eternal damnation, eternal hell, eternal separation from God. And that is, if, if you're hearing this, this sermon, if, you, if, you're, if you're viewing this today and, and this is your position, that you have to this point in your life rejected Jesus as Redeemer, then know that what, what awaits you is a judgment from God that says you are not his and eternity with him will not be yours. What will be yours is eternity, is eternity separated from him in hell. That's not what you want. I can promise you that. And so I, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to pay attention to what we're talking about today when it comes to redemption. So then, there, there's, there's that judgment that, that we see. We don't, none of us want that judgment. But the only way to escape that judgment is through Jesus as Lord, Jesus as Savior, Jesus as Redeemer. Once you do that, once you become redeemed, there's still judgment that awaits us. And, and it's this judgment that, that in which God judges his, his children, judges those who are, who are his, based on what they have done, based on what we have done with our redemption. What evidence of redemption have we given in our, in our lives and with our lives and through our lives? And so it's at that point that, yes, even saved people, redeemed people face some sort of judgment from this one good judge. And, 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 and so he bases that on the gifts and talents that, that he's given us, the opportunities that he's given us. And basically the question is, what have you done with those opportunities? What have you done with those gifts? What have you done with those talents? And so based on that, based on the, the evidence of our redemption, then there's some level of reward in heaven is what the scriptures teach us. You don't lose your redemption, but the level of your reward when you're in heaven is impacted by what you do with your redemption. And it's good to know, friends, that we have a judge that, as the scripture says here, who judges impartially. He shows no favoritism. There, there's no nepotism here uh, that we see from God the Father. He judges impartially. It's without bias. It's, it's not in anger. It's not with vengeance in mind. It's, it's, it's just fair. It's right. And it's impartial. And so this is where uh, it matters that, you know, when we think about, all right, he's given us his name as adopted sons and daughters, but just because you have his name doesn't mean that hey, you, you didn't do all that you were supposed to do with what I gave you, and so here's your level of reward. It's still going to be glorious, but it might not be all that it could have been. But then there's also this that we have to think about. There are also people out there. There are people in churches all around the world. There are people in churches all around America. There are people in church here at Glen Hope who think they carry the name, want to think they carry the name, Maybe sometimes even in some ways act like they carry the name. They come to church. They, they do stuff. But they're not doing it motivated by redemption. That maybe they're, for whatever reason, they're, they're just motivated to, to put on some persona for people to think. Maybe, maybe they've just fooled themselves in their own hearts. And because God judges impartially, we have to pay attention to this. And understand that for some, he will say, when that time of judgment comes, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. And so you can think that you carry the name because, oh, you got baptized some, some years ago. But if, you, if, if there's been no evidence of your redemption, no evidence of changed life, no fruit in your life, then you may be in that position where he says, I never knew you. And so my encouragement to you today, friend, is to, is to live your life in a way that is proving your redemption, 
proving who your daddy is. You want people to say, oh, he, he looks like his daddy. He sounds like his daddy. And I'm not talking about your earthly daddy. I'm talking about your heavenly father. That this is the one that we want people to say we sound like and we look like and we act like because in that is some of the evidence of our redemption. But what else do we see as we work through this uh, passage of scripture today? In verses 18 through 21, we're going to see that redemption is based on the superiority of Jesus Christ. He is superior. And that's why redemption is based on him. He is superior to any other thing that you could think of that, that you might think would be suitable for redemption. All those other things we're going to see uh, fail in comparison to him. He is superior. In verse 18, uh, the scripture says, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. So we're going to stop right there and, and talk about uh, this for just a second. And I, so I want you to understand that, that even as we understand that we, we are judged um, based on our works as a result of being redeemed. So again, that, that determines our level of, of reward as redeemed people. Uh, we must be careful to understand that our redemption is based on the work of Jesus alone. So, so those works that we were talking about have nothing to do with getting redeemed. Those works that we're talking about have everything to do with what happens after we are redeemed because Jesus is superior. So Jesus, first thing we see in verse 18 is that Jesus is superior because he is better than our efforts. He is better than our efforts. It's not perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life that has redeemed us. It is Jesus. Our efforts to produce redemption, to produce restoration with God, they always fail. Now, what is interesting is that every one of us, every single human being, whether it be consciously or subconsciously, knows that something is broken in our world. We, we, because God has planted in each man's heart knowledge of himself, knowledge of God. And so because that's planted in each of us, we all recognize our brokenness. And because we, we then recognize our brokenness, the first response in most of us tends to be trying to fix that brokenness on our own, our own efforts. We, 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 we try different things to make ourselves feel whole. We, we, we try relationships. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's leisure. For some, it's drugs and alcohol addiction. It, you know, we, we try all these different fixes to, to fix the, the, the brokenness that we, that we feel. For some, it's religion. For some, it's being, being at church every week. You have no real relationship with Jesus. You're trying to get to God. You're trying to fix your broken relationship with God just by going through the motions of activity, by keeping the law, so to speak. That's something that Paul explores in, in Romans chapter 7, uh, this, this idea of our efforts and how futile our efforts are to bring redemption in our lives. You know, the, the, Jewish, the Jewish religion is, is focused on the Mosaic law. And then they added to the Mosaic law with rabbinical law. They, 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 built, they built walls around the law to, to, to try to make it so that they would be sure that they never broke the law because, because what they understood was, their understanding was, we got to keep the law in order to be restored to God. We, we, we've, got, we've, got to, we've got to do this. And if, we don't, and if we don't keep the law, then we have to offer sacrifice. So, so that was the, the Jewish religion. 
And, and uh, Paul gets into that in, in Romans chapter 7. And really what, what he gets to in chapter 7 is, is, is the futility of the law. He, he doesn't say that the law is, is bad or wrong. In fact, he says that the law is good. But what we have to understand is that the law is, is not there as a pathway to redemption. The law is there to show us the futility of our efforts. The law is there to show us that no matter what, we can't keep the law and we can never qualify ourselves to be redeemed. It's, it's futile to try that. He, he, he says that the, that the law, uh, in fact, reveals our sin. In, in verses 14 through 25, he, he really gets at the heart of, of what's going on uh, in us as, as we deal with effort, as we deal with our own efforts in terms of redemption. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that, that I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. And so get, get that idea. Evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. So, so no matter what amount of effort that I put in, the evil that, that is in us will overcome that effort and, and derail any attempts of self-effort when it comes to redemption. He continues and says, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. And so you see, Paul deal with this, this wrestling of effort, of human effort, and the futility of this. And ultimately, he gets to that point where he says, thanks be to God for Jesus, because Jesus sets me free. Jesus is superior when it comes to redemption. Jesus is better. As we continue uh, to verse 19, we're going to see that uh, redemption is based on the superiority of Jesus because... Only a perfect sacrifice satisfies the perfect judge. Uh, verse 19 says, But with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And so we remember, God is the judge that we're talking about here. He's that perfect judge, God the Father. And one of the things we see brought out in verse 19 is that the we are redeemed Verse 18 tells us, not with perishable things, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. This is, this is the, 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 the one thing, the perfect thing that satisfies uh, the wrath of God, that satisfies the judge. We see all throughout the, the Old Testament that, as I mentioned, that as the, as the Jewish folks are trying to keep the law, they sin, and then they have to out offer sacrifice for their sin. And they would uh, oftentimes uh, sacrifice uh, a lamb. We would see that as, as, a, as, a, as an unblemished, as unblemished as they could get uh, to, to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. We see in the book of Exodus, as the, as the Israelites are, are leaving Egypt, all the, the plagues going on, and then the final one is the the death of the, of the firstborn of the Egyptians. And we see that the escape 
for the Israelites from this from this death, from this plague, is that they are to put the 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 blood of a lamb on their doorposts. And when the death angel sees the, the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, he passes over them, thus giving them uh, passage from death, giving them delivery from death, redeeming them from the sentence of death. And so th this idea uh, carries on to us as we read here in verse 19 that it's the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb unblemished and spotless that redeems us. No amount of effort can do it on our part. No amount of good works, no amount of trying to live perfectly because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is only the precious blood of Jesus who came to this earth and lived a perfect life, thus becoming the lamb that is suitable to satisfy a perfect judge and a perfect father. Only God himself could do that. And so he took on flesh, came to this earth, and lived that perfect life to be the sacrifice for us, the perfect sacrifice. The precious blood of Christ alone is that that satisfies the wrath of God and brings us redemption. Finally, we're going to see today that redemption is based on the superiority of Jesus Christ because his resurrection proves him superior. In verses 20 and 21, uh, we, we start getting into, into this idea of his, of his resurrection. Uh, verse 20 says, For he was foreknown, talking about Jesus, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's talk about this for a minute uh, before we really get to the resurrection part, making him superior. Uh, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. I want to make sure you understand what we're talking about. This is not some, some idea that, that God the Father knew before the foundation of the world that, that Jesus would come. No, this is saying that Jesus, God the Son, existed before the foundation of the world. He was foreknown because he always existed. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have existed in, etern in, in, in eternal history past, eternal present, eternal future. This is, he, he has always been, and, and that's the sense that, that, that he was foreknown. Uh, he, is, he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. He took on flesh, came to this earth, lived a perfect life to be this sacrifice that we were just talking about to satisfy the Father, to satisfy judgment and wrath for sin once and for all. He went to the cross then and took on that punishment for the sin of the world to satisfy God. But then God raised him from the dead, and, and this is an important part. We, we've, we've, we've seen that in the last couple of weeks as we've, as, as we've studied about Easter, the importance of the resurrection and, and being able then to, to, to believe the promises of God because no one, no one else has done that. No one else has, has resurrected to live eternally. Yeah, Jesus resurrected Lazarus, but he died again. But, but here we see that this, this idea that, that he came in these last times for the sake of you, took on flesh, dying, being resurrected, and he's going to return again. And because he was resurrected from the dead and still lives, never to die again, we can believe that he is returning again to establish his, his kingdom on this earth and that we, those who are redeemed, will be with him. His resurrection sets him apart and qualifies him as Redeemer, the only one who is worthy of that title. Muhammad is not worthy of that title. Buddha is no Redeemer. The false God of Mormonism, the false Jesus of Mormonism, and the Jehovah's Witnesses is no Redeemer. You either believe everything about him or nothing. 
You see, all that you got, you got to believe all that he claims to be. And that's the problem with Mormonism and the Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't believe everything that he claims to be. And because they don't believe everything that he claims to be, they are not redeemed. They can be. You can be. If you believe everything about him. I'm not saying you got to understand it perfectly, but you got to have a heart that's willing to believe it, that's willing to dig into it and try to understand it and know that, that when he says, I and the Father are one, that is true. When he says, I'm coming back to establish my kingdom on this earth, that is true. I believe it. I, I can't tell you exactly everything about how it's going to be and what it's going to look like, but I believe it's going to be. That, that, that's, that's walking by faith. And, and so... Jesus is the one. He is the only one who is worthy of the title Redeemer. I think over in, in Revelation chapter 5, it, it is one of my favorite passages of Scripture that really encapsulates this idea of his worth. This idea that Jesus and Jesus alone is the worthy Redeemer. Revelation chapter 5 says this, I saw in the right hand of him who sat in the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. John, John writing this is, is in a position of, of feeling desperate because he needs someone to open the book. We need someone to open the book. And as far as John could tell, there was no one worthy. But hold on. Verse 5 says, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, perfection, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever and the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshipped Jesus is the superior one for redemption. Jesus is the only way of redemption. His life, his death, his resurrection prove him to be superior. Do you know the truth of his redemption? Are you living in and under and through the power of his redemption? Redeemed people, does your life give evidence that you are indeed redeemed? If you do not know the redemption of Jesus, now is the time to know it. Now is the time to surrender. It is that simple to simply acknowledge that you are broken and that your efforts cannot fix your brokenness. But Jesus came to the earth and lived a perfect life, died on a cross and is risen from the dead to give you redemption, to restore you into perfect relationship with God. Jesus is your redemption. Friends, I encourage you today that if, 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 if this has hit home with you, 
if this if this thinking if these thoughts of redemption are getting at you and you've got to talk to someone there, there are ways that, that we can talk even even as we're not gathered in person I encourage you comment on Facebook or on YouTube if, if you if you need to know the truth of redemption let us know that way go to our church website glenhopebc.org and, and send us shoot us an email saying that you need to know that more about redemption. You want to know the truth about redemption. Find our phone number on that website and call us. We are eager to talk to you about your redemption. Jesus is eager to offer you redemption in himself. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the creator that you are, for the father that you are, for the redeemer that you are in Jesus Christ. Thank you for that truth. Thank you, God, that we can walk in it with confidence. Thank you, God, that we can walk in the truth of redemption and we can be different than we used to be. We can give evidence of that redemption. Thank you, God, that you challenge us to offer evidence of our redemption. Thank you, God, that you have given us Jesus as the superior way to redemption. That thank you, God, that you've taken it out of our hands and kept it in your own. Father, I pray that, that as we, those of us who are redeemed, that as we walk in this redemption, that we walk in it for your glory now and forever. I pray, God, for people who hear this and, and, and need to know the truth of your redemption, God, that you will give them courage, that you will put someone in their path. to to talk to them about this redemption. I pray that you'll give them the courage to call, to reach out to somebody, to email, to, to get the wheels moving, God, about this redemption that has their eternity in mind. Father, we love you. We praise you. We pray in the name of the superior one, Jesus Christ. Amen.